This is Matthew Cratter from Trader University, and today I want to answer the question, should we create extra Bitcoin? And I'll be talking about something that's called technically a tail emission. This video is inspired by a couple questions from Miguel. His question was, he said, question about Bitcoin. The biggest problem with the central bank's money printing is that it can be infinite, correct? And that is a problem. Bitcoin solves this because it has a fixed supply. However, let's say that everyone holding Bitcoins decide not to sell or use them. An extreme situation, of course, but just for the sake of argument, the system would not be good, correct? If there was this complete 100% hoarding, wouldn't it be better to have something like the protocol of Dogecoin that is also proof of work, but although infinite, the inflation rate is fixed and predictable and, and the mentioned problem of extreme scarcity would not occur. My understanding is that as long as there is a fixed, unmutable inflation rate to contrast with the ad hoc decisions of the central banks, we should be okay. So there are a couple of good questions in here. Question number one is a question that I get a lot. What if no one wants to sell their Bitcoin and every Bitcoiner becomes a permanent hoarder? And as Miguel does mention, he's treating this as an extreme situation, but just for the sake of argument. And my response to this always is that even very scarce desired things are always available at the right price. So we think about things that are definitely finite, like California beach real estate in terms of the actual land, Hawaiian beach real estate, gold, palladium, rare Pokemon cards, Picassos, you can, you can have the list go on and on. Even these very, very scarce things are almost always available. Of course, they're available at a very, very high price. And this is what I think will also happen with Bitcoin and its scarcity. These things are scarce and expensive, things like California real estate on the ocean, but you can still always get some, even though it might only be a tiny sliver if you don't have the money. So you might not be able to afford a, a beach house in Hawaii, but technically you might be able to rent a bedroom or afford like a small, a small postage stamp version of it. So I think the same will be true for Bitcoin. Bitcoin comes in these tiny little slivers too, called sats or satoshis, and there are 100 million satoshis in each Bitcoin. And so if and when sats achieve dollar parity, where one satoshi equals $1, that will mean one Bitcoin will be worth $100 million per Bitcoin. It's a very large number, and it's hard to even imagine, uh, but this is definitely that's something that's, that's quite possible. And this would be a combination of Bitcoin adoption increasing, as well as the US dollar debasing itself against real things. Here's another reason why I think that Bitcoin hoarding is not a problem. We certainly haven't seen hoarding with shares of Apple stock or Amazon stock or Microsoft stock, where the founders had these very, very large positions. Of course, you can dilute a company, you can dilute equity, but it's, I think there's a similar dynamic with Bitcoin where I might never sell my Bitcoin. In fact, I'm never going to sell my Bitcoin. I might borrow against it at a certain point. My children will hopefully never sell the Bitcoin that they inherit from me. And my grandchildren hopefully will never sell that Bitcoin that they inherit from my children. But I think you reach a certain point where maybe my great grandchildren will probably sell all of it to buy their own planet somewhere. And of course, that's a little bit of a facetious joke. If you're enjoying this video so far, please hit that subscribe button and help others to find this video on YouTube. So that's the first question, the question about Bitcoin hoarding. I don't think it's a problem because people have different needs and wants and everyone has their, their price that they're willing to, to sell out probably or exchange for goods and services directly. Now, question number two from Miguel, should Bitcoin add tail emissions like Dogecoin or Monero? And Miguel was suggesting this is a way of dealing with Bitcoin's extreme scarcity, basically making sure that there's always Bitcoin being created from now to the end of time. This is something that Dogecoin does as of, if I'm reading this correctly, since the beginning of 2014, when the last block reward would have run out the developers added a tail emission, basically every block that's ever created from now on to the end of time, or as long the end of, of Dogecoin, each block will carry a block reward of 10,000 coins, if I'm reading that correctly. Monero has something very similar, which actually took place starting at the end of May 2022, where the block rewards, instead of letting them drop to zero, Monero also has this tail emission where each block uh, miners earn 0.6 uh, 
um, Monero per block. So these are tail emissions, and they mean that the, the total supply, the total future supply is technically infinite, but you get to infinity very slowly because these are very small amounts. And the idea is just to make sure that the miners stay incented or incentivized. Now, wanting to add tail emissions to Bitcoin is an admission that you don't think that, tran that the transaction fee market will be enough to compensate Bitcoin miners after the last few Bitcoin or even the last few sats are mined. Right now, when a Bitcoin miner mines a new block, it gets 6.25 Bitcoin. This is the block subsidy plus the transaction fees for every transaction that has been included in the new block. And at some point, these block subsidies will drop to zero or, or asymptotically, asymptotically drop towards zero. And basically, the miners will be relying on those transaction fees. I don't think this is going to be a problem falling Bitcoin miner rewards. The block subsidy has been falling since the first halving in 2012. Hasn't been a problem, a problem over the past 13 years. The price of Bitcoin has moved up as the miner block subsidy has fallen from 50 to 25 to 12 and a half to 6.25. The Bitcoin hash rate seems to keep hitting new all-time highs. In fact, we just hit a new all-time high in the hash rate. So there doesn't seem to be anything stopping people from wanting to mine Bitcoin. And again, this block subsidy is moving towards zero very slowly. We're approaching it asymptotically and over time. So there's gonna be plenty of time to adjust something if it is really needed. This is not uh, this is not a big problem. We'll be able to see how it plays out. Now, as for tail emissions, if you create a really small tail emission relative to the current supply of Bitcoin, it probably doesn't do anything and is kind of a waste of time. But if you create a large tail emission relative to current supply, let's say you increase the, uh, the, the amount of new Bitcoin by a million Bitcoin or something terrible like that every year, you basically just violated the first, first commandment of Bitcoin, which is that the 21 million coin max supply cap is a sacrosanct thing. Here's the most important thing to keep in mind. If Bitcoin had originally been released with a tail emission, I think that probably would have been okay because at least the monetary policy would have been transparent and constant going forward, but it wasn't. And, and Satoshi chose not to include a tail emission, though it probably occurred to him. I would say that today and always going forward, the most important thing is just not to change Bitcoin's monetary policy. The whole point of Bitcoin's monetary policy is that it was set in stone at the beginning and it will never change. We have this 21 million coin cap. We have the halvings where the block subsidy, the block reward goes down from 50 to 12, 50 to 25 to 12 and a half to 6.25. And everyone knows what this, what this, what this monetary policy is. And so if you change it, that sets a really bad precedent. Ethereum's ex an example of a system that's changed its monetary policy every few years, and in some cases, every few months. It even changed its whole consensus mechanism in September of 2022, from proof of work to proof of stake, in order to virtue signal about energy consumption, and also to give pre-mine insiders more control. Because under proof of stake, the more coins you own, the more control you have over the system. And this is not true for proof of work. Because Ethereum has changed its monetary policy so, so many times, this is this means that it's not ultrasound money, even though a lot of Ethereans claim that it is. Just because you change the protocol, just because ETH was changed a couple of years ago to burn mining fees and try to make it deflationary, this doesn't make it sound money at all, because sound money doesn't have its this precedent of the monetary policy being changed again and again. And in fact, this EIP, I forget which one it was, that where you burn the mining fees, it really is just a blatant attempt to pump prices at the expense of those doing the hard work of mining and securing the network. So ETH is not ultrasound money. It can be deflationary in terms of its supply, but you don't know what path it's going to take over time. And now it's captured by all the large staking pools. Lastly, why would any, anyone want to switch to a different proof of work coin? Let's say we wanted to move to Dogecoin because it has this tail emission and Dogecoin also runs on proof of work, just like Bitcoin. The problem is Dogecoin is not, it's not a serious competitor. Bitcoin has a much stronger global brand. It has a much longer history. Dogecoin is literally a doggo joke coin. Also Bitcoin, the Bitcoin network has a much higher hash rate than any other proof of work coin. And I think people don't realize how, bi how big this disparity is. So the current Dogecoin hash rate is about 297 
terahashes per second. This is a very large number of hashes that are being performed every second. If we convert terahashes, 297 terahashes to exahashes, we end up with 0 0.000297 exahashes when we do that conversion. Right now, Bitcoin, by contrast, has a hash rate or an average hash rate over the past 90, day, 90, 90 days of 216 exahashes per second. So 200, what did I say? 216 exahashes compared to 0 0.000297 exahashes. So we can see how far Bitcoin is ahead of all these other coins, including Dogecoin, in terms of its hash rate. So that's the hash rate for the past 90 days. That's the average hash rate. The actual hash rate uh, today, or over the past the past uh, 200, I'm, I'm sorry, the past 2016 blocks, the hash rate is 242 exahashes, which is even higher than 216 exahashes. So I just want to say thank you, Ethereans. Thank you, Ethereum, for retreating from proof of work. You lost the proof of work game. I know people will say Ethereum was always planning on transitioning to proof of stake, and there is some truth to this. But if Ethereum had been the number one proof of work coin, I think it would have made people much more hesitant to move to proof of stake. So now that Ethereum has retreated from the proof of work arena, there's really only one coin left there, and that's Bitcoin. Proof of work, as we've said many, many times on this channel, is a really, really special thing, and it helps to maintain Bitcoin's neutrality. Proof of stake is too much like the current fiat system. Proof of stake always devolves into captured, controlled coins. If you want to learn more about this, I have a whole playlist on YouTube, which I will link to in the description notes below, and you can work your way through all of these videos, proof of work versus proof of stake, etc. I like this tweet from Lynn Alden saying that Bitcoin now has 94% of the market cap of proof of work coins. And once you understand how important proof of work is, you really see how Bitcoin has already won the race, even before the race is completed. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.